Well, thank you for coming and welcome to uh, Southern Eastern. Um, and we have um, Councillor Francis on with us as well, who um, isn't very well, but has joined us on Teams. Um, just to advise you that this has been uh, broadcast and it will be um, able to be viewed online after this meeting as well. So this is live and will be able to be viewed for subsequent broadcast. Um, we've received apologies from councillors Benasconi and Stora, so thank you for that. And we've got um, no others presently. Um, has anyone got any declarations of interest they'd like to declare, councillor Sunday? Um, I had an agenda. I'm a member on two organisations that receive external funding. One of them being the Committee of Friends of the Birmingham Museum Trust, but also the trustee of the CBSA as well. You received, is that a pecuniary interest? No, it's not. Non pecuniary. So I don't agree with this. Okay, cool. Just, just to let you know. Yeah. Um, but I think this was changed recently, wasn't it? Yes, so the. Um, so I suppose for you, you cancel. Just in light of the information on the agenda and the declarations of interest, yeah. do you believe that another registrable interest? Like what? What you've actually disclosed is how it fits into that. Um, may I add a comment? I think this came up at the arts funding report that came to the March cabinet, where there was a decision to be made on level of funding. I think this report is just for information, not for decision. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't suggest that Councillor Sandu has got a declaration of interest, has got a declaration in the in the funded organisation, but not that's going to affect any decision making from this committee. Well, so I appreciate that. Yeah. And there's a precedent that in court notes recently, that two councils were asked to leave the room for similar interests to, um, in terms of a similar type of interest. I mean, if we want to, if we want to play it safe, then I'll, I'll leave the room. But then possibly I'm more happy to chase it up after after the meeting to the facts. And I do have any. It says may speak on the matter only if members of the public yeah. are allowed to speak at this meeting, not. which they're not on one particular on the um, session on the agenda item. They just speak on the matter. So only if members of the public are allowed to speak on this matter may Councillor Sand who speak on this matter. So but Councillor Sand could sit here. But not speak on the matter. But, but, but we have a, a, a an agenda item which will go into private session, um, in which this the, this is the agenda item the Birmingham Culture Sector Challenges slash funding. Yeah, in, in which case the members of the public can't speak. So I'll have to ask you to leave the room. Yeah. Could you? But can I? But, if but I, I think you can. I think you can take part in agenda item number six, but you can't take part in agenda item number twelve. That's being so, the, so I, the original interests may not speak, I think that's a bit clear, but otherwise must not take part in any discussion or vote on the matter and must not remain in the room unless they've been granted a dispensation. It says not uh, I, I, I would suggest it. I'll leave the room. It might be, it might be worthwhile in contacting the monitoring officer. Yeah. So is, that, in, is that for both six and twelve? I'll because members of the public can speak on six. They can only observe, they can't uh, speak in this. I'll leave for six as well, but I'll get it clarified by watching. Sorry. In the future, if you have a if you have a registrable interest like that, you can seek dispensation from the monitoring officer. So, so yeah. So my, my thinking was because it was a non pecuniary interest, because of course it's an external appointment by this council, uh, both uh, both external appointments uh, approved by the council uh, and cabinet. Uh, um, I would assume that I could declare at the start of the meeting, but. If that's the way the precedent sets it, I'm yeah, cool to leave. Sorry, like that. Because it's also that other registrable interest, so it's just about getting clarity. Sorry, well, I'll, I'll go to the monitor after. Sorry. And um, any other declarations of interest? So uh, next item is just to agree the action notes of the full meeting held on the 1st of February. Any comments on the action notes? Are they acceptable? Agreed. I, I take silence as agreement. <laughs> and it's just to note the action tracker as well. Um, there's no updates from it apart from, uh, I think I wanted to make one comment.
Um, it was just work maybe required to identify gaps in provision around um, uh, access to swimming pools, which um, uh, future committee may be able to take on board. Um, but is there any other comments on the action tracker? About, um, so we remember we had a discussion about access to swimming pools um, and how the guidance, which is um, how far away people should be able to live from a swimming pool. So there's some confirmation around um, what Birmingham's um, access is at the moment. Then uh, we're going to go on to agenda item number six. So I'll ask Councillor Sanju to leave at this point. Thank you. I just want to, before we start, um, just um, let everyone know. So if there is anything um, that you wish to comment on or ask about um, the app Appendix 1, I just love how I tried to show that to the camera then. Appendix 1, please don't make any comments on it until we go into private session, which will be later in the meeting. Um, so that is only for you to discuss in private session, but you can make general comments about what Simon or Jane are going to discuss with us today and also um, about any any comments there, but just not about the private appendix which you have received. Is that clear? Yeah, cool. Um, should I pass over to you, Simon? Yeah, happy to happy to go. For, I suppose, uh, Chair, if I'd like to preface what I'm going to say as far as the report is concerned, that um, I think it's evident that there isn't an easy time for the cultural sector at the moment, both in this country and, and uh, but also just in Birmingham, but also in this country at large. So it's a national issue, not one that's unique to Birmingham. Um, I think it's also important to say that the business model for the majority of our cultural organisations, and I mean arts and heritage and culture at large, is more fragile than the counterparts in Europe. And I know that from our experience of a EuroCities Culture Forum, when we have the opportunity to go and meet with our EuroCities European colleagues in other cities. And generally in Europe, the state is funding the large, particularly the large lyric sector organisations and the regional government. And so there's a lot more security of the public support for arts and cultural organisations that perhaps uh, we, we have in this country where the business model is much more a mixed economy and is, as I say, much more fragile. Uh, and the reliance on earned income is, is uh, a big issue, a big part of the business models. Um, that, that our cultural sector organisations, and okay, I say not in just in Birmingham, but nationally. Um, so there's a, a lot more reliance on the the, the earned income uh, that that you know businesses have, cultural organisations, to sustain them, themselves and remain viable. Um, obviously, the recovery since COVID is ongoing, uh, and that's been a major factor in trying to build back audiences um, and there's further pressure as we all know with the local authority budgets uh, in terms of meeting their own statutory requirements uh, and the pressure on on uh, the, the the cost of living the energy increase in crisis has presents a, a, a rather bleak future I'm, I'm conscious of that and there is no easy fix to this to this challenge however there are some mitigations should we say on the horizon and I'll talk more about that um, and uh, perhaps it raises more questions and answers really in terms of this current situation. But to the report itself, I hope members are, are, are fully appraised themselves of what uh, what I've put in here. Um, the cabinet member of Council Francis and I uh, unfortunately can't be with us today, but we've met with all of the regularly funded organisations in the council's portfolio of which there are nine. Uh, and also the, obviously the Museums Trust as a separate contract. So we've had a fairly in-depth session with the majority of those organisations, and that's given us quite uh, substantial feedback that, that sort of informs uh, our, our report here today. Um, most of the organisations that we've spoken to, the majority of them have been successful in securing full national portfolio organisations from the Arts Council. Uh, there are nine organisations, I say, that we fund that also are funded by the Arts Council. So that's that's a positive. But again, the Arts Council funding is at standstill. There's no inflation on that funding. Uh, the previous support that was available through the Cultural Relief Fund, supporting organisations through COVID and recovery is no longer there. Uh, and the Arts Council, whilst there are still project funds to access, they are under as much pressure as indeed other local sector, local authority sector bodies are in being able to provide 
additional funding to support these organisations through um, this current challenge of, of financial difficulties. Um, I've said in the report that the feedback that we've had can be summarised uh, by reduced trading income over the next two years in line with, with the sector trends. The cost of living crisis has a deeper impact on obviously the availability of public spend for going out for culture. And we're seeing a reduction or, or sort of not a return to the level of audiences that we've had pre-COVID. Pre, uh, pre um, the hybrid working actually is an interesting one that we haven't quite taken into account that there is less, much less city centre footfall day to day and indeed in perhaps people staying on for the evenings to enjoy cultural activity than there has been before. The rising cost of utilities, obviously, we're all conscious of, particularly in energy costs. And I was looking at the Museums Association website earlier today, where some museums are facing up to 300, 400 percent increases in just energy costs. Uh, and of course, we can all appreciate the, the running of venues, uh, particularly large scale venues like museums and theatres and galleries is extremely expensive. But aside from that, the increase in staffing costs, trying to meet that the, the cost of inflation, there's always a relatively low wage in, uh, in, in the cultural sector anyway. And organisations have been trying to do what they can, B Music, BMT included, to retain staff by offering a fairly minimal level of, of increase in, in salary costs in the, because the, the is losing uh, um, uh, labour to other perhaps more well-paid um, uh, posts and therefore there is a challenge to recruit people into the sector. A lot of these cultural rely on um, uh, temporary, temporary staff uh, to run their, run their shows or their exhibitions and it's getting increasingly difficult. Uh, the suppliers that are charging 10 to 15 percent more across the board because their costs are increasing. I mentioned that the uh, public investment from last council is at standstill uh, with no inflation, and that is the case for for us as a council. No inflation increases, um, and obviously all of this sort of results in um, organisations not meeting their their targets uh, and projecting deficits uh, or overspends both last financial year, because we're now in just into, into the financial year, and indeed the, the financial year ahead. Um, so that replete, that depletes reserves for those organisations, and there's only so far that can go in terms of continuing drawing on reserves to meet deficits. Uh, and some organisations will be will be at the end of their deficit or go, or go beyond uh, their minimal operational reserves requirements, uh, and some of which are already at that level. Uh, so it, it is a challenge. Um, that's the general situation, and I'm sorry to sound so bleak. I will come on later to, to some of the, the positives, perhaps, that are coming uh, forward. Um, BMT, I won't go into the detail that's in the report here of how the arrangements for the trust uh, were set up. And since we've been running the contract with museums uh, who have a 25-year contract and lease, but the contract is renewable every four years, which was just renewed in 2022 uh, for the further four years, but as I say, without without inflation. Um, the uh, BMT was also successful in securing its national portfolio organization uh, status. They, amongst other NPOs, as, as the acronym for national portfolio organization, did apply for more funding, but uh, they got the same or standstill budget uh, with no uh, inflation. Um, in a general point, again, UK tourism under the Association for Leading Visitor Attractions uh, is said that the sector is recovering slowly and museums are trending below pre-pandemic levels of visits. Uh, and Alba expects a recovery for at least two years. And I say that is reflected locally. So uh, as I manage and on behalf of the Council, the museum's contract, uh, we were alerted late last year to uh, a potential in-year deficit of 22-23 and a projected deficit for 20, uh, 23-24. And we've been working with my finance colleagues and indeed BMT, uh, uh, appointed an independent, in the absence of a finance director, in, in independent financial consultant. And so we have uh, now reached uh, a, a much clearer picture of the uh, end of year position for BMT and, and the projected position going forward, which is uh, to be discussed in more detail, Chair, at the uh, the private appendix part. Um, 
last but not least on the, the Birmingham Museums Trust, as members will know, the, the BMAG um, element of, of the trusts, one of the nine sites and the key sort of flagship site is currently closed for uh, the electrical works, which has been taking place in the council house. And subsequently, we were successful in securing five million pounds from something called the MEND Fund, Museums, Estates and Development Fund, uh, to um, to repair, to do, to undertake some significant repairs for uh, BMAG, both internally and externally, replacement of lifts, roof and uh, glass repairs uh, on the exterior of the building. But that means that the uh, the delay, uh, BMAG's reopening will be delayed further into 2024, 25. But obviously, the opportunity to not access uh, five million from the, from the government scheme wasn't um, was was to be you know obviously um, uh, secured. Other than uh, losing the opportunity to do that, uh, more recently BMT have been alerted to the fact that they can apply for National Lottery Heritage Fund uh, for a further uh, development uh, or an improvement of the gallery um, and. There's a question here about whether, because that now takes 12 months, whether we in fact have to delay the closure of BMAG um, further uh, than 25 into 20, perhaps 26, late 25, late, early 26. But of course, another five to 10 million is a significant amount of funding. It could be that there's a reopening and then a phased redevelopment as well. And this is what's being worked through at the moment. But BMT have requested a further 4.6 million from the council. Uh, towards the reopening costs, uh, whilst we are funding them and compensating them for the closure of BMAG during these electrical rewiring works, um, that doesn't account for the necessary refurbishment that, that well, they've told us about for the 42 gallery space uh, that they that they have to contend with. So we're taking that through a separate cabinet report uh, and full business case at the moment. I'll move on to B Music uh, first uh, before I get on to the mitigations. Um, B Music, which is another, I should have said at the beginning, another sort of oversight company under the company governance uh, committee of the council. Because in effect, should both the trust uh, and B Music uh, wind down, the liability of their assets and operation would fall back to the council. So in B Music's case, that would be the town hall in particular, but also the liability for the residency and tenancy of the, of the Symphony Hall. Um, as we know from the last meeting, the, the Symphony Hall costs uh, for B Music are increasing in terms of their service charges. We have, uh, since the last meeting, we have tried to investigate further uh, how the council could assist uh, in those lease uh, service charges, but it is a very complicated matter, Chair. And again, there are some there, there are some elements to do with the relationship uh, with the lease and the NEC group that I need to put into the private appendix. But suffice to say, um, in the recommendation of the Arts report that went to March the 21st Cabinet, um, we put a specific recommendation in that, as it says in the report here, to support B Music with an in-depth financial review in 2023 to identify the measures and funding that could be secured to meet the increasing service charges at Symphony Hall. I think it's worth saying that in the overall 1.3 million grant that we give to B Music, um, only, only about 160k of that is left after they've paid the service charges to uh, to the NEC ICC. So, um, however, that that grant, if you like, amounts to the similar amounts that we do give to CBSO and to to BRB. The difference, I, I suppose, for B Music is that they are not funded as a NPO organisation, unlike the other lyric organisations who receive significant funding from the Arts Council. I think B Music get around 80k a year as an NPO from Arts Council but we are the primary funder other than their earned income. So that again goes back to this question about the business model that each of these organisations have being different. Um, perhaps then on to the good news before we get on to the detail of the private appendix, Chair. Um, the, uh, uh, the Cabinet approved in, in the 21st of March meeting uh, the funding for the next three years for these nine, ten arts organisations, um, which obviously gives them some stability over the next three years. And it's interesting that that funding period matches the Arts Council's NPO funding period, 2022 to 2026. So um, that, that, that helps in alignment in, in terms of those organisations being able to uh, plan 
their next three years, knowing what their core funding is going to be, as opposed to chair. In previous years, it has been on an annual basis, and that's been quite difficult to project and plan sort of three years ahead. And it, as I say, it matches the Arts Council funding period, which, which helps in our relationship with the Arts Council and our discussions around the funding of arts organisations. So on to other mitigations or matters. Um, we're working with the um, Culture Central, which is the culture sector's members organisation, uh, on other initiatives to support culture going forward. One of those being the Cultural Compact, uh, and which will help deliver the cultural strategy for the city, uh, and uh, something called a New Philanthropic Network for Culture, working with an organisation called New Philanthropy Arts and Culture, NPAC for short. Um, we've had a couple of meetings already uh, to set up, to look at setting up a new philanthropic network for culture in Birmingham and the West Midlands. Now, um, whilst that may not generate uh, the replacement funding, core funding for arts organisations, it will hopefully generate new money coming in to culture from philanthropists, essentially, uh, to support project work and cultural engagement activity over the city. Um, in a, in a sort of more uh, strategic way, we, in terms of the legacy funding from the Commonwealth Games, this ties into the other uh, element that this committee is looking at about legacy of the Commonwealth Games. I'm halfway through the business case for uh, a four million pound programme from the legacy, which would come from the Birmingham 25% for culture. And uh, I'm hopeful that that funding uh, will, will be approved late, later this month, early May for the next two years, DCMS have stressed that any legacy funding that was given back will be spent within the next two years. Um, but that that injection of funding will be the largest injection of, of revenue funding that we've had for culture and cultural engagement in this city since, since in fact, I've been here. Um, in addition to that, I'll talk more about that in a moment. In addition to that, the Shared Prosperity Fund has come through and there is an element of that for, uh, available to deliver cultural activity across the city in meanwhile spaces and high streets. And again, uh, whilst that doesn't replace core funding for revenue, it will help uh, both cultural and creative organisations to deliver more activity in more spaces across the city uh, over the next two years. And then the 1.4 million enterprise zone funding, which is um, currently being assessed at the moment, and we'll come back to cabinet for approval uh, later this year. But again, that could potentially mean another 1.4 million of cultural engagement funding uh, for cultural action zones, I beg your pardon, across the city over the next year. This, this program was previously run by the LEP. Uh, and as we know, the LEPs have since wound down. So the council will be inheriting that bid, that project, to take place. So uh, a fairly substantial amount of money that we otherwise didn't have for revenue support for culture coming up over the next um, three years. Um, again, moving on to the, uh, the legacy of the Commonwealth Games, um, as you members may know, we've committed to, uh, to stage the uh, one year on culture festival in July, August this year, which the council has underwritten. And again, we're hoping that we can secure additional funding from the legacy fund to provide further support for that cultural festival to take place beyond this year from 2024 and to develop um, an annual culture, significant annual cultural festival for the city. Uh, and of course, uh, the work that, that is doing, uh, there is an independent uh, uh, community interest company led by the uh, Hippodrome that is de developing this, uh, uh, this new festival for this year, but also um, putting plans in place and the new governance structure for an annual festival uh, for, from 2024. Um, the, the 4 million cultural legacy fund uh, bid for cultural engagement across the city is going to be quite groundbreaking if it's approved. As I say, it's a significant amount of money, but this is actually truly uh, doing, uh, being able to do things that we've not previously been able to do with the rather limited amount of project funding that we've had available from the city. Uh, and uh, in very simple terms, trying to really increase the grassroots engagement for culture across the city that we've not really been able to do, uh, really opening up, making the, making the programme much more accessible, opening up to other groups that aren't necessarily a, a um, poor funded arts organisation, uh, 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 sorry, a statutory uh, funded organisation, but opening up to other community organisations that are also delivering cultural activity across the city. So I've got high hopes and aspirations. We have got high hopes and aspirations 
for that uh, that bid going forward through the uh, the legacy board in the city council. Um, since I wrote this report, and this more relates perhaps to the the uh, private appendix, but uh, it's been announced by the government that they're going to continue uh, to um, extend the energy bill relief scheme. Relief scheme that'll provide some relief for businesses, including our cultural sector businesses, on uh, on their challenges with the energy. Um, bills and also the cultural relief rate for museums, theatre and orchestras has been extended from 2022 to March 2024. Uh, so that'll that'll particularly aid people like the Rep Theatre and the CBSO uh, in terms of their the relief that they can claim on on their activity. Museums obviously BMAG is, is less uh, uh, supported because it's closed at the moment but Obviously, on reopening, that would be that would be a benefit. But obviously, for all, on, on the museum, sorry, the uh, there's been a, a, a royal courts of justice ruling that uh, now means that museums can qualify for a much lower rateable value uh, to their facilities than has otherwise um, been the case. It's this been a case going on since 2018, particularly with Exeter museums, but also York, and there is benefit to be had for our own museum service on the rateable value. Uh, of their of their museum's estate coming down, and I'll talk more about that in the private appendix. I feel I've I've rambled on a bit, Chair, but that's the essence of the first part of the report, and I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you. Um, I'll start. If any members wish to speak, please do um, put your hands up. Um, your comments around uh, you know the culture sector being being in a mixed economy in the UK, but not so much in Europe. Um, I think is really important, but I think you know we've got to remember, we've got to acknowledge. I think that the private sector and the public sector, if they were doing it alone, wouldn't be able to um, sufficiently um, provide a cultural offer either, um, because they would both be having some of the similar challenges that we've got around um, energy um, and the cost of living and other issues around that are putting funding stresses on. But one of the things that I'm I'm quite interested in when the museum officially reopens in 2024, um, what will the opening times be? Um, will they be what they were before, or will they be changed opening times to reflect perhaps the need to gather a different kind of audience? Um, it won't be 2024 reopening. It'll more likely be 25 because of the extended works that are happening. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I think the intention is certainly to open at the previous previous opening times and the availability. Much depends on, however, and this relates to the private appendix, as to the arrangements and finances that the museums are able to, to afford going forward. And kind of similar to that, though, about garnering um, more attraction, um, you know, I think that in currently we you know we have a we're in the 21st century and i think there is a generation of attendees um to various cultural attractions in the city that perhaps don't come into the city center as much as they used to um but i also think that the way that we look at culture and arts has changed dramatically um across new generations and i just i, I would like to know perhaps um encourage work to be undertaken to create a plan engaging a new generation of potential attendees and visitors for the 2020s and beyond and I also think that there perhaps needs to be um, a, a bigger emphasis on using the the cultural space that we have for other things that aren't related explicitly to culture and art such as hiring for social events private events and functions because um, I do think that that would help us raise a significant amount of income because you know we've got some great buildings and some great venues um, that we should be offering out as, as a more of an emphasis as well and, and marketing that more um, to private organisations and companies who may wish to hire us out for mini conferences or parties or events. Um, obviously, there would have to be quite significant risk assessments because of the things that are inside these buildings and the buildings themselves. Um, but I just kind of want to want to see the work being done to make sure that we attract a new generation. <laughs> Yes, I mean, we, uh, just to reiterate, we don't actually run or manage those organisations. We are the funding of their. We're, but we're 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 responsible um, if they were to perform poorly and have to wind down, like you said, we're responsible for yeah. potential costs. I think we? we can assist them. I mean, one of the one of the initiatives that we've got is we've having not had a tourism office or officer for well, ever since I 
we, 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 we campaigned for internally and secured a tourism office with a small budget. He sits in my team and he's done a fantastic job. We've got a visitor destination plan. There are various hero, and that's available for everybody to see, but there are various hero themes within that. We call them hero themes, but based around music, culture, food, you know, a number of things that where we are trying to develop the visitor economy for the city. Uh, and there are a number of initiative, initiatives in train that are hopefully trying to increase the number of visitors coming into the city. But you're absolutely right, Chair. It is beholden on, on all of us and, and those organisations. I mean, Sarah Wajid, who's chief exec of the museums, talks very, very well about the museum sector becoming relevant or being relevant to its to community it serves. And we've obviously got a very young population. We've got a very diverse population. Now, if the museums aren't attracting, and I'm not signaling them out, but you know, if they aren't attracting the, the, the population that, that we serve, then that obviously has to be addressed. And it's about, as you say, developing audiences for the future. That that does apply. And, and you know, I, I'm sure any of our cultural organizations listening to this debate is going, well, we're all trying to do that as, as best we possibly can. But I, I get your point that the more that we can drive up uh, those audiences, the better. And uh, just a final made before I hand over to anyone else who wants to ask comments. Um, I don't know if this is a question that um, I think it's OK for me to ask the question, but I don't know if it's a question you may wish to answer later in the private appendix. But do we know what the estimated costs to the council would be if those organisations were to wind down? No. OK, thank you. That's okay. Anyone would like to make a comment or ask a question? Councillor Harris. Just to carry on from sort of um, Councillor Deakin's point about, you know, our heritage sites, you know, being accessible and being accessible to more diverse communities. Um, I mean, we've had some email exchange about the opening of some some of our historic sites, because I was particularly concerned about Blakesley Hall not being open. Um, a similarly depressing meeting I had was going and was sitting in Blakesley Hall, which is a picture perfect Tudor building with a you know million. Mm. Empty. Mm. And I know you talked at the beginning about how reliant we are on earned income. I just don't know if we're not open, if there's, if we're not open or we're not finding creative ways to be open and for people to come to those uh, sites and to spend money. I don't know how, you know, we can get that earned. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's very sad, really, to hear you talk and it's very sad to... I did a quick sort of assessment of, of what, which of our nine sites were actually open, you know, and Blakesley Hall won't be open for Easter, it won't be open for Whitson, it won't be open until the summer, and I know it'll be open from June till November because you've clarified that, but if we're not open and we're not engaging with our communities and our communities are not coming in, I don't know how we're going to earn income. So it's a question, I suppose, about the model, you know, the, the trust has been running for a decade is the model right? You know, is it working? I think we do need to to, to look at that, but and, and that's what we. we that, I think it's been a perfect storm. And um, just to go back over detail, that the council's contract fee for the museums has reduced quite significantly since 2012, basically through you know obviously austerity and the need to try and make efficiencies, etc. And that's put tremendous pressure on the museum. Uh, as it, and we're not the only local authority that's alone in that. And, you know, other museums have uh, have closed and been closed down or running on, on temporary hours. The current situation is very much to do with the unforeseen deficit that's coming into this financial year. So cost savings have had to be made, including staff. So there's a slight irony in somewhere like Blakesley Hall that to staff it up is still more expensive than actually the opportunity to try and, to try and recoup the income. Uh, that's a that's a conundrum to be it is to be wrestled with this it is absolutely and uh i don't want i don't want to single out blakesley hall but that's that's the case this current situation and you've been appraised of the, of the opening hours um and but it's a difficult balance for uh operators not just museums to make between uh the the earned income that can be generated against the costs of keeping a building open that's the case. It's the creator, and I know, and I know, and I have some sympathy with this. I think Cats did. He's talking about this in terms of conferences or exhibitions, or in the case of Blakesley Hall and Yardley, it's weddings. And I know the wedding venue, the wedding um, business is down, and yes. and that in terms of COVID. 
but there's a creativity required, isn't there? I mean, uh, I don't know how true it is, but I understand pizza in the courtyard at Sareholm Mill is quite successful. So it's just the creativity to keep these um, sites open yeah. or keep them open for longer um, because it's difficult to engage with the community and get people through the door if mm. uh, if they're not open. And that leads me a little bit on to, on to sort of, and I'm pleased to see some sort of community engagement, but in terms of volunteering, I'd be quite interested to hear about your sort of volunteering programme because you do talk quite a bit about staffing costs and those those increasing costs. Um, you know, I'd just be interested in terms of the sort of volunteering programme in terms of supporting those staff for sites to be open or for cultural activities to I take think place. I have to talk on behalf of the cultural organisations and so the city doesn't manage any of these yes, facilities or sites. We're, we're sort of funding them to, to deliver. And we don't, we don't tend to interfere with the management and the operation of, of, of the facilities because that's not our job. But um, they rely heavily on volunteers, all of them actually. But to try and replace paid staff, for example, stewarding at, at a concert with a volunteer is, is, is difficult because the volunteer doesn't have any obligation to be there, may not turn up, isn't paid to perform a particular role. Uh, you know, when you when you pay staff, they are there to, to perform a function and to be the, the caretakers of the audience and of the and of the business. Volunteers, you can't put that responsibility on to volunteers. So whilst volunteers are a massive asset in terms of helping run projects and programmes, they, they can't really replace core paid staff. That's always been the case. Can I interject before you continue? I appreciate what you're saying, Simon. And also appreciate the, the, the comment about um, that we don't have managerial oversight or influence. Um, perhaps that is something that should be looked at in any possible renewal of contracts in the future in terms of what um, more involvement and scrutiny we can have. Yeah. Tearing uh, point of view, sorry to interrupt you, Councillor Harry. No, no, it's fine. Um, you know, in the Commonwealth Games, we have thousands of volunteers and actually we wouldn't have been at, I know you, you know, comment around paid staff and we have to be very careful about talking about using volunteers instead of paid staff. I, I do think we do. Um, but in the Commonwealth Games, we have thousands of volunteers and the comment was that that wouldn't have been possible without those volunteers and that we, we, we did rely on them to perform um, quite vital functions that we wouldn't have been able to afford having paid staff to perform. So, and, and there is there was there was a, a desire from the Commonwealth Games to make sure that we continue to facilitate um, the continual volunteering from those who did engage with the Commonwealth Games and um, from a volunteering aspect. So I do think that, there, that Councillor Harris is right, that there, is, there does perhaps need to be a slightly more reliance and actually a little bit more trust put on volunteers. But I think that's also about the way that the Commonwealth Games ran the volunteering programme was very formalised. You know, you had to have quite a significant application process um, and some people weren't accepted to volunteer. So it was quite stringent in that in that process. Um, but I do think there kind of needs to be an almost, um, you know, come and help us save our cultural um, offerings in the city. And you can be part of that by taking on a serious volunteering role. Yeah. And actually, I commented earlier about how, you know, there are people that used to come and attend these uh, venues who perhaps are a little bit older now um, but perhaps doing uh, volunteer in their communities who might actually want to re-engage with these organisations from a different aspect than they used to when they were younger. So I think there's a big distinction between volunteering for a 10-day programme which is essentially what the Commonwealth Games was to a 12-month programme to sustain a venue or an organisation. It's a big distinction. I do think that the organisations are doing what they can for, in fact, one of the Commonwealth Games legacies is about increasing the volunteering capacity in the city. And we have part funded Culture Central who are, who are running the volunteering programme for the city and the uh, So I'm confident that we are doing, we collectively in the sector are doing what we can to um, to, in, to enable and encourage more volunteers to... to but listen, the, the cultural sector already across the city, both in Birmingham and again nationally, already relies hugely on, on volunteers. So there is already a massive, you know, uh, 
groundswell, perhaps it, perhaps more so in, in, in other areas than in other areas uh, where volunteers are committing their time to you know develop cultural activities, support cultural organisations. So it's not an easy solution, volunteers. I don't mean, need to extend this debate further than necessary, but I, ju I just think there's scope to look at volunteer. We're in very difficult times. Staffing has been highlighted as one of those issues. And I just think we have a really hungry, a hungry population. Um, for We've seen it through the Commonwealth Games. We see it with the Friends of the Parks group. A lot of our parks wouldn't be maintained to the standards that they are if we didn't have the volunteers that do that work. And I just think this sector you know, could really um, access that, you know, that, um, I won't say workforce, because I take your point, it's not replacing paid staff. But, yeah. but you know, there's, there's a, a wealth of people there who could support the sector. Yeah, well, I, I'm happy, Chair, to come back and get a further sort of, um, a further appraisal from, from our cultural organisations about what they are already doing with volunteers, you know, where their where the volunteers are already supporting their programmes and activity, but also what else they might be doing, to, as you say, Councillor Harris, to to help assist the, the, the management and running of those organisations. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question, but I don't know whether it's in the private report. I'm not sure how much. Is there a how much? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> well, well, I'm interested in the culture festival. I'm interested in the cost of that. Of the cultural festival, yeah. Uh, this year, two million pounds for which has been funded by the city council, been been guaranteed by the city council. But that's over and above the four million. That's over and above the, the separate bid that separate. we put in. Yeah. And so it was on in the following year that would be another two million or it that's to be worked that, out and that's the figure that we, that's been indicated to us by this organizing uh, organizing group that's been set up to i mean uh, it, it is fairly small beer in comparison to other major international city festivals such as manchester although manchester is biennial that's something in the region of five million i think a year or the each festival it's an international festival. as an international festival indeed so, uh, but there's plenty of growth there for potential, you know, achieving sponsorship and other income for the for an annual festival, uh, other than what the city council is currently uh, is currently putting up. Um, just to say, I mean, I welcome the sort of philanthropy, that sort of approach. You know, that. Yes, and we were lucky that the NPAC, as they're called, approached Birmingham and said we'd be interested if you are to try and develop a philanthropic network for culture, and we said, of course. I don't know what results it's going to it's going to achieve, and it's very much down to the net worth individuals whether they feel that culture is something they wish to. Because of course they have all sorts of different philanthropic uh, things that they want to support. Um, but we hope that we. Could, I think it's going to be project based support, not revenue support, if that makes sense. Um, Councillor Deakin, I just wonder, in the light of what Simon said, in terms of he's not able to speak in terms of each of that our sort of historic sites or for B music or for the trust. Do those do we have individuals or rep representation that come to this committee? I think I think there's a there's an opportunity that we could ask um people from those organisations to come specifically um as part of the committee session uh, in the future. Just a comment from Jane, uh, Councillor Francis, who has lost her voice by the way, which is why she's not engaging um, as much um today. Um, she, in terms of the volunteers, Councillor Harris, um, she said that she'll take that away for some further thinking. She has just dropped us a message to say so. Um, are we content on this item? Um, I expect that we'll blow quite quickly through um, the rest of the items until the private session. Thank you very much um, so far, Simon. Um, we will come back to you very quickly. Um, so this is just um, agenda item number seven, which is on the work programme. So it's for us to review the work programme completed during 2022-23 and recommend any issues that should be carried over um, to be or new issues to be included in the scrutiny work programme for 23-24. Um, um, yeah, right this second. Um, but in terms of stuff to take over, 
Um, we do have a few things at the bottom of the last page, page 32, um, which were to be scheduled, which is around the cultural strategy for 23-33 and the external review of culture. Um, sport and physical activity strategies, which um, we're told are still at an early stage of development. Um, and um, the economy and skills ONS, we um, did never get around to inviting them to our committee um, for a report on employment and skills legacy of Commonwealth Games. Um, but I'm sure actually that might be beneficial to take that um, forward anyway, simply because there would be um, hopefully a little bit more data on not only the initial impact of the Commonwealth Games on skills and employment, but whether that impact has sustained itself. Um, in the current environment. Um, and then we did talk about enhancing tennis opportunities across the city, and I think um, we were expecting a report back. Um, are we happy for those four things to be carried over into the new municipal year? Um, no requests for calling or councillor calls for actions, um, but no specific urgent business. But councillor, I think you asked for something between the last meeting and this meeting, is that correct? I did. We've touched on it slightly and Simon has responded, as has um, Councillor Francis. It was in terms of the winter closures of our nine museums and heritage sites. Um, obviously, in BMAG, we know is closed and we've heard it may be closed till 25, 26 completely. Um, Blakesley Hall, Soho House, um, you know, closed throughout the winter, won't be open for Easter, won't be open for Whitson. Um, so, you know, it's just a pretty, you know, sad state of affairs, really, that, that, that they're not open. I see the Museum of the Jewelry Quarter, they're having essential works done, but they're having it done in May to July, when you might suspect that's a summer season when it might be open to more visitors. Um, so that's what I just asked for some clarification on. Um, and I did have a good answer, so thank you for that. You know, comprehensive answer in terms of what's open and closed, but I still in principle, would like to explore their closure during the winter or the amount that they're, they're open or closed. Um, obviously, I can't debate that today because um, it is an urgent business, but um, I'm glad you asked it. Um, and I think, you know, I think I touched on it slightly earlier with Simon, which was around, I asked about the specific opening times um, for when, they, when it does reopen. Obviously, that's subject to change. Um, but, you know, I would really like to see, I actually think extended opening hours of some of these venues would actually increase um, well, that's not the economic yeah. output um, that we can achieve. Earned income. How can you earn the income if they're not open? But I understand there are issues. There's still some sort of, you know, a real impact from COVID and visitor numbers. I, I understand all this. Um, but I, I think we should review it, really, at some point. Perhaps, perhaps we can um, just go back to the work programme for a quick second. Yeah. And actually, as part of reviewing um, the cultural strategy, we could, if we could just add perhaps an addendum or an additional point um, to the work to be looked at in uh, the next municipal year um, something around um, looking at kind of the um, something around what we just discussed around the kind of well it's the it's the winter closures and then even during the summer there's sort of opening time limit, limited closures but but it, you know the answer is it, it's the affordability of being open, of staffing it and all the things, you know, and it costs more to open it than, than to have it closed. But that's a terribly sad state of affairs. You know, I take the situation of uh, Blakesley Hall with a modern, well, I mean, it's 20 years old, but it's got a cafe, it's got a visitor centre, you know, but, it, but it's closed. Some might argue that this should perhaps be considered under um, economy and skills or resources, but I actually think there is um, sufficient... Uh, chance to look at this from a cultural perspective specifically. I'd, I'd welcome that. I think there's a sort of acceptance of the winter closures and acceptance of the limited opening hours. And then, uh, so no, no urgent business, and then um, before we um, agree to uh, exclude um, the public by shutting down the broadcast, um, just authority to chair and officers um, between meetings, if that is agreed. Yeah. yeah. Um, are we happy for uh, the public to be excluded from the rest of this meeting due to a um, private item? Um, um, and then we'll go back to Simon. Is that uh, okay. acceptable? 
Okay, I'll just have to start largely.